Hey everybody, this is Steve, and we've forgotten what faith is. We're more than halfway through Great Lent, yet we still have a few more weeks of intense prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and repentance ahead of us. And right about now is when I start dreaming of juicy cheeseburgers and ice cream and... Really, the only word for it is... No, 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 Steve. Focus. If you're also finding Great Lent a bit difficult, we should talk about why we might be tempted to start easing up on our ascetic struggle, to cheat a little on our fast, to miss one of the extra weekday services at our parish, or to splurge a little money on ourselves instead of helping someone in need. Last week, we explored how Christ calls us to journey towards eternal communion with Him by picking up our cross and carrying it to Golgotha. And now, just one week later, taking a break from carrying that cross Seems like a really good idea. I could use a break. I mean, are we really sure that there's going to be a resurrection on the other side of our crucifixion? Are we absolutely certain that God is real and calling us to this difficult work? How deep is our faith? Really? Well, maybe the problem is that we've forgotten what faith actually is. And we're in luck, because the Church dedicates the fourth Sunday of Great Lent to St. John Climacus, a great saint who lived in the 6th and 7th centuries. We call St. John Climacus because of the profound book he wrote, The Ladder of Divine Ascent. St. John describes our ascetic Christian struggle by using the image of a ladder with 30 rungs, each of which is a step away from our broken, sinful ways and closer to an encounter with the living God. The top rung, the pinnacle of this ladder, is the culmination of all the ascetic struggles that lead up to it. That top rung, which St. John explores in the final chapter of his book, is about love, hope, and faith. Faith is the goal, the top rung on the ladder, so we're going to explore it today because faith is something we all struggle with, especially during a time as intense as Great Lent. Sometimes we start to wonder, why am I doing this? Do I really need to pray and fast to show I believe in God? And will anything bad happen to me if I just stop? Is there really a point to all this extra prayer, fasting, and almsgiving? And when we ask those questions, we tend to feel bad about it, as if that means we don't have enough faith. Because, as modern people, we tend to approach faith in one of two basic ways. First, we think faith is something that exists in our minds, because faith means certainty. And the more faith we have, the more certain we are about doctrines and teachings. And second, we treat faith as nothing more than religiosity, something we stay in touch with by engaging and participating in the activities of our religious group. By the way, if you're interested in learning more about how we approach faith in our modern world, then you should definitely check out Effective Christian Ministry. You'll even find a coupon code in this week's workbook. In other words, as modern people, we say we have faith if we completely agree with a statement like, Jesus is both fully human and fully divine. That's certainty. Or we have a relationship with our faith if we show up for church services or ministry events. That's religiosity. But this isn't what St. John Climacus is talking about when he places faith at the very top of this ladder of ascetic struggle. St. John has something different in mind when he sees faith as the end of our journey, as encounter and communion with the living God. And the scripture readings for this fourth Sunday of Lent help shed some light on what exactly St. John, and the Orthodox Church generally, means by faith. Go on! In this week's Gospel reading from Mark chapter 9, the disciples seriously drop the ball. Earlier, in Mark 6, Jesus sends his disciples out in pairs to heal the sick and minister to people. He even gives them authority over unclean spirits. He gives them the power, in other words, to cast out demons. And, for a while at least, the disciples went out to the people and did exactly that. They went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons, and anointed with oil many who were sick, and cured them. Yet, between chapter 6 and chapter 9, something happens. The disciples, who used to work great wonders in the name of Jesus, suddenly fall short. And we see the consequences of this when one man steps out of the crowd, kneels before Jesus, and delivers 
some bad news. The disciples couldn't help his son. Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a dumb spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it dashes him down, and he foams, and grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. Jesus responds to this by turning to his disciples and calling them a faithless generation. In Matthew and Luke's version of the story, he calls them not just faithless, but perverse. Boy, they came out of nowhere. Actually, this calls back all the way to Deuteronomy 32. It's a passage known as the Song of Moses, which we explored back in episode 10 of our Live the Word series. In this song, Moses calls the people a perverse and crooked generation. He describes how they consistently turn their back on God despite all the wonders he works for them. The Lord freed them from slavery in Egypt, and they complained. He fed them manna from heaven, and they asked for meat instead. Again and again, the people prove self-absorbed and forgetful of God, which is why Moses left his song as a sharp reminder for the people. And yet, Years later, Jesus identifies another faithless and perverse generation, his very disciples. We're going to get to them in a bit, but first, let's take a look at the man who approached the disciples, hoping they could heal his son. But, as you remember, they didn't. So the man turns to Jesus, yet he makes his request with some reservations. If you can do anything, have pity on us and help us. Jesus responds, if you can believe. All things are possible to him who believes. It might seem like Jesus is saying that having faith means believing really hard, that having faith is about having certainty. But then the man responds to Jesus with this important confession. I believe. Help my unbelief. So the man kind of believes, and he also doesn't. He has some doubts, and he even admits these doubts to Jesus. And yet the Lord responds to this man's doubt, not certainty, by healing his son. On the other hand, the disciples of Jesus really did believe they could heal the man's son. Like we said earlier, they'd been doing this kind of thing for a while, so they were shocked when they were unable to free the man's son from his demons. You can almost hear the surprise and confusion in their voices when the disciples take Jesus aside and ask him, why could we not cast it out? To their surprise, the Lord's response is simple and to the point. This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting. So there's more to faith than just being certain about something. Otherwise, the disciples would have been able to cast out that demon by themselves. But when Jesus tells his disciples that they could only accomplish that through prayer and fasting, we may be tempted to make that other mistake about faith and see our Christian life in terms of religiosity, something we participate in by staying engaged in the activities of a certain group of people, by doing things like praying and fasting. But that's not what Jesus is saying. And Jesus certainly doesn't mean that prayer and fasting are ingredients in a magic spell that would give the disciples power to do superhuman things. I mean, I've prayed and fasted before, and I haven't gotten any of those results. That's not how it works. No. Jesus brings up prayer and fasting here for a different reason. Because ultimately, prayer is reaching out to God. It's humbly realizing the limits of your strength and abilities, and asking God to act. And fasting is a way of practicing putting our own will to death of inviting God to act in and through us. In other words, prayer and fasting are about emptying ourselves so we can be filled with the Holy Spirit to guide our words and our actions. So, in this week's Gospel, when the disciples ask why they couldn't cast out the demon, they're asking the wrong question. When Christ responds by citing prayer and fasting, practices that open our lives to divine action, the Lord is saying, why didn't you ask me to cast out the demon? Why didn't you let me act through you? So, in the middle of the Lenten season, when we may start to feel our faith waning, the disciples' lack of faith helps us see what faith really is. And in this week's epistle reading, we also learn about faith through the example of Abraham, the great saint and patriarch of the Old Testament. 
In the Epistle to the Hebrews, St. Paul describes Abraham as one who patiently endured much and received the promise of God. Yet, as we covered back in episode 169, while Abraham received the promise, he didn't live to see it fulfilled. In fact, during his life, at certain times, it almost seemed as if God wasn't going to follow through on his word. When Abraham was 75, an old man and well-established in his home, God called him to uproot himself and his whole family and enter the land of Canaan. And the Lord promised Abraham that his descendants would inherit the land, even though it was full of Canaanites, which seemed absurd. Yet Abraham trusted God wholly, living in tents as a foreigner, waiting his entire life for a promise he didn't see fulfilled. Later, God promised Abraham and his wife Sarah a son, even though they were way too old to have a child. Again, it seemed absurd that God would ever fulfill his promise. Sarah even laughed when she heard it. But Abraham trusted God. And sure enough, Sarah gave birth to a son named Isaac. Years later, secure at least in this promise being fulfilled, God again spoke to Abraham and told him to sacrifice his long-awaited son as an offering. This instruction from God wasn't just absurd like the other ones. It seemed cruel. And yet, Abraham remained faithful. He continued to trust in God. He climbed a mountain with Isaac, built an altar, laid the wood for the fire, tied up Isaac, placed him on the altar, and unsheathed the knife. At the very last minute, when Abraham was about to kill Isaac, an angel intervened. I really hope you can see just how deeply Abraham trusted God, his faith. Even in the face of seemingly absurd or cruel instructions is mind-blowing and challenging because it often takes much less to cause us to stumble and lose our faith. I mean, we've only abstained from meat for three weeks, and already a lot of us are wondering if this is really worth it. On the other hand, Abraham endured so much and was willing to give up everything, including his beloved son, because his faith was that deep. And that's because the faith that Abraham displayed and our notions of faith are not the same thing. I mean, why was Abraham faithful when God asked him to move his entire life to Canaan? To explain this, Paul writes that Abraham looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. In other words, Abraham looked ahead to the true promised land, to the kingdom of God, and committed his life to that kingdom. Why was Abraham faithful when God told him that he would have a son even in his old age. Paul writes that he considered him faithful who had promised. In other words, Abraham believed that God himself was faithful, that he was trustworthy enough for Abraham to commit himself to. And perhaps the toughest question of all, why was Abraham faithful when God told him to sacrifice his only son? Paul writes that he considered the fact that God is able even to raise someone from the dead. That even if God was going to take Isaac away for a reason Abraham couldn't understand, he knew that that wasn't the end of the story. That God had the power to bring his son back from the dead if that was the right thing to do. Abraham entrusted himself to God completely, even before God fully revealed himself to the world, even before God became man died on the cross, and rose from the dead. Abraham was faithful even before God fulfilled his promise by taking on flesh and becoming human. Yet the disciples had the incarnate word right in front of them. Despite being able to look upon the face of the Lord, they failed to entrust themselves to God, which is kind of like us, because we have received the incarnate word and we've heard about the resurrection and experienced miracles in the church, and yet we still struggle with our faith. We still struggle to be faithful to God. In our minds, faith isn't the faithfulness of Abraham, the fruit of a divine encounter that can weather even the most challenging situations. And it isn't the ascetically grounded trust in God of St. John Climacus something born of a lifetime of patient and prayerful struggle for the sake of a person, not just an idea. Instead, what passes for faith today seems built on intellectual religious trivia or superficial 
religious affiliation. It's either having the answers to the difficult questions about God, or simply showing up to all the church stuff. Which is why we see the faith of young people shattered when it's challenged by ideas in our culture, or dried up when it's no longer sustained by programs and activities. It's why a teenager can be active in youth groups and Sunday school and summer camp and parish sports and immediately disconnect from the church once those programs are over. The solution to this isn't more of the same more programs and activities that are instilling the wrong kind of faith. And it isn't having the answers for why God does everything he does. There's a better way, the way of prayer and fasting, of self-denial rather than self-indulgence, of prayer at home and attending the divine services in the parish. It's the way of the cross. It's the way of willingly entering pain and suffering to minister to those in need trusting that our own experiences have been caught up in the pain and suffering of Christ. It is trusting that God will raise the dead, not only our dead sons, like Abraham, but our very own dead selves. And this is how the Sunday of St. John Climacus ties into the story of Lent. Over the first three weeks of Lent, we examined the scripture readings and themes of each Sunday in order to get some insight into what the Church is trying to cultivate in us as we prepare for Pascha. We learned about the fulfillment of God's promise in the Incarnate Word, who we can see and touch. We explored how the Incarnation and the Crucifixion and Resurrection allow us to come to know God and enter into eternal communion with Him. And last week, we explored how we reach that communion by picking up our cross and following Christ to Golgotha, where we will be crucified with him so that we can resurrect with him. But in order to endure that crucifixion with Christ, we need what Christ had, faith. And not faith in the sense of certainty or religiosity, not in the sense of belief or showing up. No, Jesus had faith in the sense of faithfulness, fully entrusting himself to his Father, even when his calling was so difficult, so painful, so scary, that it made him sweat tears of blood. Before Jesus was arrested, he prayed to his Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the last line of his prayer was, Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Later, when he is hanging on the cross, and all hope seems lost, with his last breath the Lord cries out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When we hear these words of Jesus from the cross, we realize that the faithfulness of Abraham was an image of the faithfulness that Christ himself had in his Father. And the faith that Jesus criticized his disciples for not having was not just some abstract ideal he just talked about. It was a faith that he himself showed and embodied when he fulfilled the divine plan of salvation a faith that is best understood as faithfulness, as fully entrusting ourselves to God even in the most difficult moments, and even when we have doubts about things that don't seem to make sense. Just like the man in the Gospel reading said to Jesus, even though I have some unbelief, I entrust myself and my son's well-being to you to help that unbelief. This is what we are doing when we increase our prayer and fasting during Great Lent. We are putting ourselves in the hands of God, because we know that only that faithfulness will help us endure the cross that we must die upon in order to achieve eternal life. The cross that Christ himself died upon in order to trample down death for the life of the world. And God is calling us to do the very same to offer ourselves on the altar of his love, and to trust that we are caught up in the grand story of his cross, trusting that, on the other side, what waits for us is life everlasting. When we have this trust in God, faith is no longer just believing in some religious facts or a club we join. Instead, it's a way for us to be transformed, a way for us to enter into the death of our old and broken selves so that Christ can live in us. A way up the ladder of divine ascent, so we can reach a place of love, hope, and the authentic faith of Abraham. A way that we can trust because Christ himself walked it, revealing himself to be the true and living 
way. So let's be the bee and place ourselves in God's hands. Be the bee and live orthodoxy. Remember to like and subscribe and share. I'll see you all next week. It's a new year and a new opportunity to lead more effective ministry. Download this week's workbook to get a coupon code when you register for effective Christian ministry. To learn more, click on the link on the screen or go directly to effectivechristianministry.org.